I've got one of the very first Els Vanyar Pro 2024 disc frames in the UK right here. Before these frames even reach customers, we're putting this beauty to the ultimate test. From bearing checks, scrutinizing that fresh matte paint job, the geometry checks, we're gonna dive deep. And you won't want to miss out on what our endoscope reveals from inside the frame. Oh, and I also had to do some chopping unexpectedly. I'm also a little bit ill, so the throat's a little bit croaky, but the show must go on. Classed as a climbing oriented bike, it's one of the lighter weight offerings in the L's frame range. Not as hefty as the Falaf Evo, and we will be weighing each component later in the video. It's the first item I notice is the seat post. However, it's worth mentioning that this is not the final version that will be sent out with this frame. There's a bit of a story behind the seat post, more on that later. Next up are the handlebars, the Arom Aero Evo bars. These are the same model as I have on my Els for Laugh Pro. The saddle is something quite different and interesting, a 3D printed design with a full carbon base. Now the texture resembles a sponge like look and it feels like a sponge to the touch. It does look pretty good. This saddle however is not standard with the frame unfortunately, but it is an additional item from Elves that you can buy. I can't wait to get my cheeks on that. Get a grip. The frame itself is matte black presenting a sleek and minimalist aesthetic. A corresponding matte black fork subtly adorned with a gloss logo complements the frame well. Both design choices should resonate with riders who appreciate an understated look in their bikes, like I do. It's not plastered with bright decals like you're riding a company advert. In the package, there's also a five year warranty card. Let's hope I never need to use that. We also have a press fit BB386 bottom bracket, various headset spacers, a compression plug, essential gear for those opting for electric group sets and the standard nuts and bolts required for assembly. A spare derailleur hanger as well and a manual, which I probably won't read. The manual is actually pretty handy to be fair. Let's take a look at the paintwork. Let's start with the disc brake caliber mounts. These are of the flat mount design. Now looking at the front caliber mounts, my initial thoughts are, positive. I'm a little unsure about whether they've been faced properly, but the true test will come during the brake installment and alignment. As for the rear mount, there seems to be evidence of facing. Some markings suggest it's been worked on post-production. Inspecting the inside of the derailleur hanger mount, it looks clean without any imperfections or manufacturing residue that can sometimes be found or I've seen in the past. Let's see if the head tube is ahead of the game. I think I need to get out more peeps. Anyway, upon examining the Els Vanyar Pro 2024's head tube, the matte finish is pretty impressive, devoid of any imperfections. Peeking inside the head tube, there's no paint overspray on the top bearing seat. By touch and sight, the top bearing seat also feels pretty good. This is mirrored on the bottom bearing seat, a quick swipe with the old index finger, no roughness or bumps in sight. Transitioning our attention to the top tube on the Els Vanyar, there's interesting geometry at play. From a side perspective, the top tube flaunts a low profile design, but shift to a top down viewpoint and its width becomes evident. For context, let's draw a comparison. I took measurements from some of my other frames. Now the Els Falaf Evo is five and a half centimeters, the Yolio R11, four centimeters, the Els Falaf Pro approximately four and a half centimeters, the Rinna Scouter, five centimeters, the Vanyar slots in at five and a half centimeters, so similar to the Els Falaf Pro. The region surrounding the seat post entry deserves a nod of approval, no evidence of paint over spray inside the seat tube. This seat tube isn't too big or thick, it's pretty standard, not shouting for attention. There's a slight curve on the tube, making room for the tire to move more freely. And you can fit tires up to 30 millimeters on this frame, and we will test that shortly. Taking a look at the down tube, it's evident that L's are heading in the direction of thicker tubing. It feels chunky, which does give a sense of strength. Now the paint quality is consistent throughout the frame and on the down tube, it's no different. It's sleek, no visible imperfections. And I've inspected this quite closely because for some reason I'm like that. The seat stays, they're fairly straightforward, nothing too fancy here. Each side displays a Vanyar logo. The stays themselves are on the broad side. They branch out directly from the seat tube. Naturally moving on to the chain stays, they're noticeably chunkier. There's a certification number inscribed on the inside. Take note of the maximum rider weight, 100 kilograms. Time for me to uh, stop eating all the pies. Actually, I'm only 80 kilograms, so I can eat plenty of pies. The bottom bracket around the inserts and faces of the bottom bracket is looking all good. No paint overspray in there either. Switching gears to the forks, there's a hint of overspray on the crown race. This is the only place I've seen a little bit of overspray. The matte finish on the fork blades remains consistent with the rest of the frame, crisp and refined. The gloss Vanya logo is also present. The seat post also has a matte finish, but importantly, there's a textured area which ensures grip when it's installed so that it doesn't slip. No one wants that. 
For the handlebars, I'll be using the Arom Aero Evo bars, which are a fully integrated cable bar. Now, I might go for DI2 semi-wireless on this build. I don't know how many more times I can ask Johnny to do a fully cable-rooted build before he says, no, Jordan, enough's enough. I can't take any more. When testing out the seat post, I stumbled upon a little hiccup. The seat post didn't slide in as deep as I'd expected. It felt like something was obstructing it. So naturally, I reached out to Els for some clarity. Now they informed me that the frames will be shipped with different seat post lengths based on the frame size. So sizes 47, 50 and 53 will come with a 350 millimeter seat post, while the larger sizes 56 and 59 will come with a lengthy 400 millimeter one. My frame is a size 50, but it's been paired with the longer 400 millimeter seat post. Thankfully, there's a straightforward fix for this. We need to trim it down to 350 mil. Time for some chopping, a rough measure of 50 millimeters, five centimeters. It doesn't need to be super accurate. I secure the seat post in the stand, mask up for safety and give it a wet cut. I'll save the trimmed off bit as a keepsake. How emotional. After the modification, the seat post slid in much better, going past the 10 mark, which is the final mark on the seat post itself. However, why the initial resistance? Why didn't it slide all the way in? Now, according to Els, the lip inside the seat tube is built in and is a safety feature. It prevents a seat post from dropping into the narrower region of the seat tube or crushing into the bottle cage mount, both of which could cause unwanted complications. Now we will look in the seat tube with the endoscope shortly. Diving into the bottom bracket, this frame comes equipped with a press fit 386 bottom bracket. Now to be precise, an inner diameter of 46 mil and a width of 86.5 mil. Having taken a fair few measurements on the left side of the frame, I hunted for any discrepancies from the 46 millimeter mark. Almost all the measurements hit the 46 mil target spot on. A tactile examination further reinforces this as I felt the smooth interior with the old index finger and there were no bumps or anomalies. Now the story wasn't different on the right side either. Measurements here all hovered around that 46 mark consistently. When it comes to the build though, the true test will be how effortlessly the bottom bracket fits and if both bearing cups are actually aligned to each other. Onto the headset bearings and they are defined as one and a half inch bearings top and bottom, so 52 millimeters, and it's a seven mil deep bearing on the top and an eight mil deep bearing on the bottom. On measuring the top bearing seat, we've got these readings, 52, 52.3, 52.1, and 52.1. Our measurements are right in the ballpark. When we push the bearing into the actual seat, it nestles comfortably within the frame, exhibiting no sort of lateral play when we give it a sort of push from side to side, which is good to see. Now the measurements for the bottom bearing seat are 52.1, 52.2, 52.3, and 52.1. The bottom bearing is also 52 millimeters wide and our measurements are once again in line. Now despite the bearing being a tad more challenging to extract compared to the top, a snug fit, isn't something I'll complain about. So what's the maximum tire size this frame can handle? Elves have stated that a 30 mil tire is a max. So let's put that to the test. I'm gonna actually put a 32 mil tire on there with the Arom carbon rim. I'm focusing on the rear since the clearance at the back typically dictates the max tire size for any frame. The tire does spin, but the gap between the tire and the frame, especially from the underside view, is minimal. A bit of dirt on your tire and you're gonna grind your carbon frame down like an old wheat mill. Now I'm personally leaning towards a 28 mil tire for this frame. As a reference, I've checked out the fit with 28 mil GP5000 tires. And as you can see, there's a comfortable amount of clearance on all sides and plenty of clearance to the seat tube as well, making it a safe choice. The Vanyar Pro 2024 comes in various sizes. Now my choice, I opted for the size 50. Now, if you've been following my previous builds, you'll know that I usually lean towards a size 52. But after diving into the geometry chart, I found that the 53 to be larger than what I'm used to from my recent builds. It's easier to make a small bike big than it is to make a big bike small. So playing it safe, I picked the 50. This frame is also classified as pro geometry. This hints at a potentially more aggressive stance when riding. Exactly how that translates to the real world experience? Well, we'll have to see how that is post build. Now let's grab the trusty endoscope and uh, prod this frame and we'll find out if there is inner beauty or dark depths. Internally, the head tube presents a well-finished construction. Often imperfections or wrinkles inside this area can be an indicator of sort of rush or inferior carbon layering. 
However, in this case, it's all looking good. The internal finish of the down tube stands out. You can see the cleanly integrated bottle cage inserts are especially noticeable. No fraying or carbon shards in sight at all. I went to look inside the top tube to find that it's sealed at the head tube, so there is no way in. Maybe this is done to increase strength. I'm not too sure. Without being able to view it, you'll just have to use your imagination. The bottom bracket appears to be of high quality. There's an intriguing observation where the seat stays sort of meet the bottom bracket. Initially, the area looked a little bit patchy, but on closer inspection, a good old rub down with a thumb reassures me that it's just a cosmetic trait and not a structural compromise. It's solid. Internally, the seat tube offers several points of interest. The internal ridge that was acting as a stopper for the seat post can be seen pretty early on. As Els have said, this is in place to stop over insertion of the seat post. As we head further down, we can see the clean integration of the bottle cages and the front derailleur inserts. Then as we head further down the seat tube, we can see the bottom bracket from above. Let's look at the fork and see how the front brake is rooted. Now, cable routing, especially in performance bikes, can be a source of frustration if not done right. Here, there is a distinct pathway for the cable, which suggests a potentially smoother cable operation. Now for all you weight weenies, let's get stuck in with the scales. Now the claim weight for the frame is 870 grams, specifically for a size 47 that is unpainted and excluding all parts. When I weighed my frame only, it came in at 1000 grams for a size 50. For the forks, the claim weight was 430 grams, excluding the through axle, and when I measured them, they came in at 417 grams, which is 13 grams lighter. The seat post claimed weight is 215 grams. The actual weight was 236, showing an increase of 21 grams. The weight of the bottom bracket, 117 grams. As for the through axles, they have a combined weight of 77 grams. Adding everything up, the combined weight for all of these components is 1,847 grams. You can tell me in the comments if this is good or bad. So the big question is, is this Els Vanyar Pro 2024 good value or good value for money, good bang for buck? Now the price I'm told is going to be around 800 pounds or $1,018. While this is still a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, when you compare it to other offerings from Western brands, that's where you can see the value. Now, if you are looking for a carbon frame for a bike build, something like the Els Vanyar Pro 2024 is definitely worth considering, probably at least put it on your shortlist. That's a complete overview of the Vanyar Pro. Check out this video next where I review the Falaf Pro in depth, the racier, bigger brother of the Vanyar. I'll be doing a full build on the Vanyar soon, so do subscribe if you don't want to miss that.